The Bengalis of East Pakistan have paid a heavy price in blood for trying to break away from West Pakistan and forming the independent state of Bangladesh. The battle for this crossroads at Jessore, a town on the road linking Dhaka, the capital, with the Indian border, illustrates the ruthlessness the West Pakistani army has shown ever since President Yahya Khan ordered it into Bangladesh at the end of March. The defenders here said they fought the Punjabis with what weapons they had, but there were no signs of any Punjabi dead. The local Bengali commander describes what happened. The Punjabis were here and they took position to against the Liberation Army. From here and they fired the uh, three inches mortar from here and they killed this, so many innocent Bengalis, Bengali Liberation Army and the innocent Bengali people of the citizen of this town. But they aren't here now, and what happened? We, are, uh, we resist them. We resist them with our weapons and uh, just at uh, 4 p.m. 4 a.m. 4 a.m. Uh, 4 a.m., yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. 4 a.m., they retreat from here and when they retreat, they burnt all the houses of the innocent peoples, mm. innocent Bengali peoples, and killed brutally to them through their bayonets and through firing. Everywhere in Jessor, there was evidence of the savagery with which all civil wars are fought. Here in the courtyard of one villa, an old man and his family, three women and their babies, were bayoneted to death. Pakistan went careering down the road to civil war in the last week of March when the Bengali leader Sheikh Mujib and his Awami League party failed to get the terms they wanted from President Yahya Khan. In the early days of the secession, the Bangladesh Liberation Army, ill-equipped and badly organized as it was, put up stout resistance against the superior Punjabi forces but the Bengali's success was more apparent than real. For more than two weeks, President Yahya kept his troops bottled up in strongholds, permitting only skirmishes with the Bengalis. Then, springing from their fortifications, the Punjabi regulars, reckoned to be the toughest fighters on the Indian subcontinent, smashed simultaneously into a dozen or so Bengali towns. The civil war was virtually over. This was Dhaka, the capital of East Pakistan, a few days after the army had moved in to crush the Bangladesh secession. Eyewitnesses said 24 entire blocks of the city had been flattened and as many as 6,000 inhabitants killed. 500 of the dead were students and their teachers. It's alleged this was an attempt by the Western government to deprive the East of future leadership. The army also put an end to any effective armed resistance by rounding up 500 policemen who were known to support Sheikh Mujib and executing them. It's estimated a total of 35,000 Bengalis have been killed throughout the country. One Western diplomat said the army committed mass murder. Less than six months after the cyclone disaster, East Bengal is again awash with refugees. The civil war has driven them from their homes in the cities and a quarter of a million of them have already fled into neighboring India. Thousands of fleeing refugees has been a recurring scene in East Bengal ever since it became part of Pakistan in 1947 on the breakup of the British Raj. Bangladesh cannot be termed a breakaway state in the same way as Biafra or Katanga. The 75 million Bengalis form two-thirds of the population, and they've adhered scrupulously to the UN principle of the right to self-determination of peoples by winning a majority of seats in the national parliament in a free election. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
They want to break away because, they say, the West has exploited them economically for more than two decades and there's no sign of an improvement. Pakistan depends for its economic life on foreign aid, which is granted on the basis of population and in theory should favour the East. In practice, East Bengal has only been getting 20%. The Bengalis claim they've subsidised West Pakistan to the tune of 3,000 million pounds since independence. The question of economic aid inevitably involves the major powers. East Bengal doesn't fit tidily into the Cold War spectrum. President Yahya Khan's government has Western connections through membership of the Defence Alliances, CENTO and CETO, and more significantly has close ties with Communist China. East Bengal, on the other hand, has only one friend, India, and India has close ties with the Soviet Union. But even though it's shown sympathy towards Bangladesh and opened up its borders to the floods of refugees, India has not so far extended official recognition to the breakaway state. Nevertheless, India feels herself involved in the events on her borders, and she's been outspoken in her attacks on President Yahya's army. The allegations were spelt out by foreign affairs spokesman S.K. Singh. West Pakistan government apparatus is obviously busying itself in diverting the attention of their own people, as well as that of the peoples of the world, from the savage and medieval butchery they are indulging in East Bengal. Their attempt is to interpret the present struggle of the people of East Bengal for self-respect, economic development and peace as another point of dispute merely between India and Pakistan. This West Pakistani attempt does not and cannot camouflage their brutality and the enormity of their crimes against humanity in general and the people of East pa Bengal in particular. Independent observers from all over the world have seen too much of these crimes for anyone to be able to hide them. Can West Pakistani publicists persuade the world that there is no struggle by the 75 million people of East Bengal against the stranglehold of the West Pakistani military machine? Can the evidence of the pre-planned carnage and systematic genocide in East Bengal by the West Pakistani military machine be hidden behind anti-Indian allegations and propaganda? Not surprisingly, the West Pakistanis reject these accusations as exaggerated. But their own claims that the country has returned to normal are equally far-fetched. European refugees arriving in Calcutta carried tales frightening enough to suggest President Yahya's future leadership of the eastern province could only be as a colonial dictator. One critic was Danish student Jan Martinussen. Well, what I actually experienced, I would rather tell you, uh, the first night, that was the, the night of the 26th, uh, it was said that they started to kill and arrest people in the cantonment. People, I mean Bengali officers. One Bengali officer escaped. The rest was murdered or arrested. He escaped to East Pakistan rifles and told them about what has happened. So they in turn killed seven West Pakistani officers and uh, followed the last one around in the city. And after about half an hour shooting, they got him. That was the beginning. What did you see yourself? Well, I talked to some of these people. I think that's almost as good. I saw killings. I saw shooting. I was sitting in the middle of the house while they were shooting just outside, outside the window. Which house did you go? Who was shooting? Both of them. One, one day we had East, East Pakistan rifles and the East Bengal regiment just outside our house. The next day the West Pakistanis had moved uh, further on into the city. That was after six days fighting. Did the East Pakistan rifles put up much of a resistance? A lot of resistance. Hell of a lot of How did you get to the port? We had a military escort. But there were no problem when we left because, as I said, most of the city was under control of the army. And after they gained control, I must tell you, they burned all the bazaar districts where they had no possibility to search thoroughly. So they just burned it up. Just destroyed it? Yes. 
and uh, I can tell you that they bombed the Chittagong radio. Chittagong radio, or Bangladesh radio, worked for the first four days. After that, they had a rocket attack with two aeroplanes coming down from Dhaka, probably. Is there any chance, in your view, that the Bangladesh forces can retake Chittagong? I think not in the coming months, but uh, later they will take Chittagong, I'm almost sure. As things stand at the moment, the chances of a concerted Bengali force recapturing Chittagong or any other town are remote. Despite the military realities, the Bengali leaders seem determined to keep alive the spirit of Bangladesh by an official proclamation of independence. At this small village, a mile from the Indian border, a triumphal arch with the motto, Joy Bangla, Long Live Bengal, and a crowd of 1,500 villagers awaited the first public appearance of the Bangladesh cabinet. With some ceremony, the acting president, Syed Islam, took the salute, then inspected the guard of honor. With the West Pakistani troops just 20 miles away, it was a gesture of defiance. In an atmosphere heavy with emotion, the green flag of Bangladesh was raised. In the absence of Sheikh Mujib, captured by the army, it was left to the acting president to make an impassioned appeal to the countries of the world for recognition and help. So I request my foreign journalists to convey it to the respective nation that if liberty has got any sanctity to them, if democracy has got any value to them, as if human dignity has got any sense with them, then I level to the civilized governments of the world, the big and the small part, the Afro-Asian countries and to the European countries to realize it, to recognize it, to come to our help and to do something positive to elevate the misery of the unfortunate people of Bangladesh. Despite this impassioned plea, there's been no rush by foreign governments to recognize the new state. Even before the fighting began, it was clear that President Yahya's only hope of a speedy end to the secession would be by a sudden, ruthless onslaught. This, by all accounts, he's done. But the longer-term problems still remain. East Pakistan provides ideal conditions for prolonged guerrilla warfare and it could well be that the Punjabis will find themselves tied down in a Vietnam-type confrontation which might drag on for years. This is the town of Kustia, which the Bengalis were forced to evacuate in the face of the advancing West Pakistani forces. Among the handful of people who'd stayed behind to fight for the cause of Bangladesh, was Mohammed Ali Nawaz, a businessman who'd lost everything in Dhaka and was determined to flee no further. Uh, you see, first thing, that if everybody fled out from the city, then who will boost up the morale of the local people? Because in our locality, we have never faced such type of war. So we are the few people, especially younger generation, we need to boost up the morale of the local people. That's why we are here. And for another reason, that we need to organize something to face the enemy soldiers. What will happen to you if the army comes here to Kustia? If army comes to the Kustia, we'll try to face them. And if we cannot face them, we'll again try to reorganize and again face them. And this will be our motto. You're, you're committed to a real guerrilla war? Yes, we'll go... F we have to continue for guerrilla war after that. Because now we are uh, fighting front to front, and if we are uh, defeated, then we'll go for guerrilla tactics. Die! 